So, uh, so here we have uh, one of the most exciting guests of all time on Coast to Coast Live. Coming up in just a minute, Glenn Kimball. I went to go research his latest work, so I went to ancientmanuscripts.com, which had been the you know traditional uh, uh, point where I would find the latest on Glenn Kimball. But no, no, that appears to be gone. Where is Glenn hanging out now but at Kimball College? More on that. And tonight's topic, we will rewrite the Bible tonight with Glenn Kimball on Coast to Coast Live. My name's Ian Punnett. All right, so we'll just have to start at the beginning here, Glenn Kimball, and tell me more about Kimball College. <laughs> well, you know, Ian, uh, <laughs> part of the problem with being an author uh, with uh, a lot of content is that uh, it's very difficult to disseminate it uh, uh, in a radio format. Uh, we only have just a few precious moments to be together, and what fun it is That's to be right. with you always. Um but there's so much information. Uh, for example, the person who know Jesus best, uh, in John 21, 25, he says, And many things Jesus did, I suppose, if they were all written, the world itself could not contain all the books that should be written. Yes. Uh, the Bible contains some 70 sayings of Jesus. My wife says that many things an hour. <laughs> There's the rest. <laughs> Your new wife. I just wait. I'm getting a lot of slapback on this line. Is everybody else hearing that, too? Uh, every time I talk, I'm hearing myself back to myself, and I don't want to distract anybody, but I'm hearing that. Glenn, are you getting that, too? Uh, we're, we've been having some electrical problems out here in Arizona. Is this better? Uh, I guess it's a little better, but I'm getting a heavy echo on the line, so I'm not sure exactly what's happening. You're the only one on the line right now? Yes, I am. Okay. I don't know what's going on. Let's see if we can improve that as the night goes along, or this would be very difficult. Uh, but no, here's but here's the thing. I went to ancientmanuscripts.com. Glenn Kimball, you know, I have the utmost of respect for you. Just one dissertation short of a PhD, popular teacher, uh, entrepreneur, uh, researcher of ancient manuscripts. And I go to ancientmanuscripts.com, and it says not there. So I go to Kimball College. So I love this idea of you started, it's what, your own sort of online university? Yes, it's it's an online university. It comes out in three uh, audio CDs a month um, designed to help people uh, get the amount of information that they need to put the pieces back in the, uh, uh, in the puzzle that we're once missing from our biblical tales, our biblical mysticism. Uh, we, we don't often understand. We all up the Bible and we think that it's a complete history. It's by no means a complete history. And so there's a lot of little enigmas that take place uh, uh, here and there. Uh, and tonight we're going to talk about one of, those, one of those huge spaces that's been missing from the Bible. Yes, we'll get to that. I get to that. I just, so there is no yet actual freestanding campus for Kimball College. No, other than online, no. Okay, and uh, but it might be coming someday. The ivy colored, ivy covered walls of Kimball College somewhere. Actually, there is some work afoot that maybe that will be the case someday. <laughs> that doesn't surprise me. What will be your football team? <laughs> My football team? <laughs> yeah, you have hey, to be man, like I the Kimball the Star, the hey, Kimball College Cougars, or something like that. You got to hey, do. Uh... And me and Warren Beatty, we buy the football team. We are going to star as the quarterback. Oh, okay, so you still have eligibility. I don't care how up. old I am. I'm going to be the quarterback. <laughs> that sounds good to me. Well, I, I wish you best of luck at this. So that's the new website. Is it KimballCollege.com? Well, we're actually redirecting ancient manuscripts back to the KimballCollege.com as well, but that hasn't taken place yet. Okay, so you can link up either way through coast to coast am dot com and and we look forward to uh, finding out more about it. I perused through it. I, I mean, I think it's very interesting what you're doing. You have a lot more on this website than I've seen on on ancient manuscripts, right? Yes, and and it's going to get very serious as we begin adding the classes uh, and all the other additional text that we're going to be putting on the sites as well. Okay, uh, and I hope, by the way, that. Um, Leslie and others back at the studio are working on this echo. Uh, if Glenn's not hearing it, it's great, but I'm getting everything I'm saying back to me about a quarter of a second after I say it. So doing the best I can to concentrate and, and to uh, carry on. 
because this is very interesting stuff and and I'm I don't have what you I only have some like rough sketch of where we're going with this. So I'm kind of I'm kind of curious about what what started you in pursuit of the Exodus story or I guess in this case really the pre-Exodus and the Exodus story. Well, the thing that uh, I I've had a lot of uh ancient text, as you well know, dealing with the uh, Exodus for a very, very long time, uh, and then having uh, jump-started that with having taken a visit to, to Egypt uh, with Princess Malik uh, a year ago, and having sailed up the Nile on her barge, and that's being a very euphemistic, uh, if that's a barge, then uh, the Hilton Hotel is, you know, <laughs> she had a ballroom there with, that could hold about 500 people on her boat. On uh, the barge. Uh, on her barge. That's a love. Yeah, it's a long way from like a garbage scow. Uh, that that's true. And okay. we had a, we had a dinner there hosted for. Uh, I, I suspect it was for John and I when we came there with film crews, and uh, she had invited uh, uh, famous people from all over Egypt, Syria, Jordan, uh, all the way into Libya, into Kuwait and Iran. There were a lot of uh, Islamic people there. Tell and, me about who's a uh, Princess Malik. Who is that? She's the lady that owns the King Tut exhibit that travels the world. Uh, she was the queen uh, of Morocco for a long period of time. Now her son is the the king of Morocco. Uh, it's not like she doesn't hold a a, a very important position uh, in in the political scheme of things in the in the northern coast of Africa. Uh, many people know her. When I when I went to visit her and stayed with her in her home. Uh, for example, Bill Clinton had been there the, the week before. I'm no one special. Why did I get this invite? I wonder. Because you have your own college. Be, <laughs> if there were some, if Bill Harvard was going there, they would have had him there too. Or whoever was the, well, you know. I know one thing that she told me uh, after we had spent some considerable time together. Uh, we had a chance to take a carriage ride through the streets of Cairo, and uh, I, I turned to her and I said, uh, "You know, I, I can understand you wanting us to come and." Uh, and do some film work with you, but and perhaps do some uh, uh, remote uh, expositions for the King Tut exhibit. But but why am I here? And she said, Well, you know, amazingly enough, Glenn, I I, I don't speak of this very often, but I had a couple of near death experiences early in my life when I had an illness, and uh, in that near death experience, I met uh, Jesus, and both of them. And she said, I promised him that in that experience that I would do everything I could to restore what he had done in Egypt and in the Islamic states. Yeah. And, and I found that to be extremely humbling and moving. Uh, she was dead serious. Um, and is she Muslim? Very much Islam. Yeah, very, so she's Muslim. So, I mean, like, you know, most, as far as I know, almost anybody who is Muslim thinks of Jesus as a prophet. So she thought of Jesus as a prophet in this context, or was she thinking of Jesus more in the context of the King of Kings? Well, I think I think people who have a near-death experience often uh, try and trail in their own uh, history into that encounter, and I'm sure she did as well. But uh, she felt like this was a terribly significant encounter with the with it, the prophet Jesus. That's, That's very interesting. Well, and you know that. Um, Malik is she's Princess Malik, you said? Mm-hmm. That Malik is that's the Hebrew word for king. Mm-hmm. And well, then, that, that's interesting, even in light of where we're going with this conversation. Well, you're, you're talking about Menelik. <laughs> but Malik, yes. Yeah, that, that's true. Mm-hmm. Yeah, all right. So so take me through this then. You you've been through Egypt, you've looked at these um you looked at the pyramids like anybody else, you meet with the people, you research the manuscript. Again, what takes you down the road of trying to figure out that gap in the Bible story? Well, there, there's a real problem that we have, uh, in, especially in Western Christianity. Uh, it comes when we, we have the story of Joseph who was sold into Egypt by his 11 brothers. They, uh, Joseph becomes, uh, he interprets the Pharaoh's dream. First of all, he's sold into slavery into the Ishmaelite uh, merchant caravans. Uh, he gets into Potiphar's, Potiphar's household. Uh, he is, you know, we all know the story of Joseph, but he has risen to the, to the state of Wazir of Egypt under Tuckmosis IV, uh, which is in second in command only to, to Pharaoh. 
then we go to the Bible and we find a very interesting statement by Joseph. He says that uh, in, in Genesis 45 and 8, he says, I'm Joseph and I'm the father of Pharaoh. And you say, is he speaking metaphorically here or is he right. speaking literally here? Right. Is it just a figure of speech? The reality is, is that he was speaking extremely literally in that particular occasion. We, and the reason why we know that is only we've only begun to understand that since 1907, when we began to discover the archaeology in Tel Armana, uh, which was on the other side, on the east side of the uh, Nile River. Uh, if you've ever, have you ever been up the Nile, you know that the Karnak and Luxor and Thebes and Cairo are on, on the west side of the Nile, but Tel Armana uh, and the Valley of the Kings and Goshen are on the other side of the river. <clears throat> Uh, so what we have here is that is the fact that Joseph is sold in, into into slavery by his brothers, and then he gets risen to the, he interprets the Pharaoh of, of Pharaoh's dream, which says there's going to be this enormous uh, famine, and he grows enough food stock to feed the entire uh, Mediterranean basin, and then by the time the 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 time of plenty, the seven years of plenty is over and he begins feeding the world, his brothers come in and find him there in Egypt, and he actually gives them foodstuffs. But then all of a sudden, the Bible jumps from the story of Joseph into a time of slavery when Moses is there for, so, for a supposed 430 years as a slave. How in the world did Joseph and his brothers come into Egypt as second-in-command to Pharaoh and suddenly jump all of a sudden to a nation of slaves part of the an important piece of the story is missing now how many years do you put in between how many generations do you put in between joseph the story of joseph and his amazing technicolor dream coat his coat of many colors or as i understand it really should be more accurately translated as just a really nice coat. It doesn't actually talk about the colors in the Hebrew. It just talks about... You like, and the Donnie length. Osmond would get along it, well. It, it translates most, I think, as like coat with long sleeves or something. It doesn't even have anything to do with color. But It actually so, does have something to do with color. Oh, not what I was just looking it up today. What did you find? Well, the coat of many colors uh, in Joseph was parodied all the way back to the British Tartans, uh, which were, the, were parodied after the coats of many colors and were found... On this family, and we'll talk a little bit more about how the how the British Tartans got the coat of many colors scenario. Well, I'm not. It doesn't surprise me that other people have interpreted it as a coat of many colors, but rather the original Hebrew, it, it would seem, doesn't actually say that. But or in any event, so they've got the uh, they've got the, the the coat, and he gets you know he gets he's favored by his father, and the other brothers are jealous. As you say, they sold him into slavery, and eventually he rises to be the wazir, the, the overseer of all of the Pharaoh's lands. Now, how many years pass well, that between is that the and the, the Moses story? That is the absolute critical question, isn't it? Yeah. Well, in order to find out, let's look at Moses for just a moment, and then I'll tell you about Joseph. Okay. Because okay. Moses is literally the grandson of and the great-grandson of Levi, one of the twelve brothers. We okay. know that because Levi had three sons. He had Gershon, Kohath, and Miramar. That's in Genesis 46.11. Now, Kohath had a son by the name of Amran. He also had a daughter later after they got into Egypt by the name of Josheved. Or, or Amram, uh, Joshebed married his father's sister, and this is in Exodus six eighteen and twenty. He married his sister, his father's sister, and this famous pair were the parents of Moses and Aaron. So we're talking about three or four generations, depending upon which of the two lines you look at. As a matter of fact. We're going to say something on Coast to Coast that hasn't been said for 3,700 years. The secret to how long they were slaves in Egypt is contained in the language of one of the Ten Commandments itself. All right. You're losing me there. Okay. Cause we're what going do you to mean by to, that? We're going to go to Exodus 20, okay. verse 5. It says that the sins of the fathers 
are visited on the heads of the children to the third and fourth generation. The sins of the fathers mentioned in this particular case are referring to the sins of the 11 brothers who were about to murder their youngest brother and instead sold their youngest brother into slavery. Okay, but the sin there would seem to end when, in the in the Joseph story, Joseph tricks his, his brothers, especially his brother Judah, into confessing that they had done this horrible thing to their little brother. He kind of yanks their chain a little bit, makes them dance to his tune, and then says, Aha, I'm your brother, and all is forgiven. And he sets them up with a home. He, he invites all their people. And it's, traditionally, that's sort of thought of as the beginning of the generations of Jews that would be born and raised in Egypt. Now, you're speaking only of Jews. Remember, there's 12 tribes here. Well, okay, but I mean, they're all the sons of, of Jacob turned Israel. So Israel, if Israel is the founder of the, the nation of Israel, then those are 12 brothers, all sons of Israel, and they all come and bring their families, and they all come and move to Egypt on, on Joseph's uh, invitation, right? At jo- not only at Joseph's invitation, but they were raised to favored status because of Joseph's status being second to Pharaoh. Right. So, so, but then where's the sin? Tell me about that. I don't get that. The sin was that the 12 brothers conspired to kill their brother, decided not to, but they still sold him into slavery. They sold him into slavery in the Ishmaelite merchant of, uh, caravan that went into Egypt. Now, that's not a nice thing to do, to sell your brother into slavery. <laughs> that's probably no. that's probably something real bad. Well, yeah, but I mean, even still, I guess I'm just trying to understand the context of this because right there, it seems like the whole point is a setup for him to forgive them, and after they've been forgiven, then isn't isn't all forgiven? All is forgiven, in in, in you know, and I'm not God. Okay, all right. I'm saying is that th- is that what they had done was was not a nice thing. Right. It was a it was a bad thing. Okay. Now, okay. But now we have now traced biblically that Moses is both the grandson and the great grandson of Levi who came into Egypt. Now that's not four hundred and thirty years, I'm sorry. No. If you remember your grand your great grandfather, you trace his was that four hundred and thirty years ago? No, let's say seventy. Well, let's maybe let's say that they live a long time and it may be Twice that. Okay, okay 150. Whatever. Okay. But it's not 430 years. No. Okay. So biblically speaking, we're tracing Moses as being the grandson, grandson and, and great-grandson of Levi. But now we look at another one of the tribes. We look at Joseph, because I promised you we would do this. Joseph had two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. But then he had a daughter when, while he was in Egypt. His daughter was named Tia. Tia marries Amenhotep the third. And so when we go to Genesis forty five and eight, where it says that Joseph is the father of Pharaoh, we're speaking literally, he's really the father in law of Pharaoh. <laughs> because the person that ha- bears all the children to Amenhotep the third is the marriage between Amenhotep III and Joseph's daughter, Tia. All right. So let's uh, start there, then, when we come back. It's, it's all going to be about Joseph of the Bible story becomes the uh, father-in-law of a pharaoh. And so, so then what's left? And we say, well, it's just a couple of generations. The Egyptians got mad at the resident Jews and uh, and then the fight starts, and there we have the story of Exodus. Uh, maybe we, does that explain it? Nope, not a lot a, more to the tale. Then we'll come right back to that. We'll pick it up there with Glenn Kimball on Coast to Coast Live. And I'll bond bumper night. Let's test out that phone again with the Glenn Kimball and see whether we're still getting that same slap back we got for the first half hour of the show. Hey, Glenn. Yes, can you hear me? I can hear you just fine. Can you hear me? I've been perfect the whole time. 
Yeah, and, and better than that, I can't hear me. So there we go. We're we're in good shape then. All right. So the the star the story starts with Joseph going into slavery in Egypt. It will end in Great Britain, and it will end in Ireland. It will the story will will move through Greece, and will go from places that you thought you knew into places you cannot imagine. And in the end, perhaps. Glenn Kimball will launch a cultural bomb on Coast to Coast Live next. This is Ian Punnett. All right, so... Uh, Glenn Kimball here, who is uh, the founder of Kimball College online, and uh, and you gotta like a guy who who still harbors dreams of winning a Heisman Trophy. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I think that's what you get for marrying a younger woman later in life, isn't it, Glenn? Suddenly, uh, I think suddenly it's a penalty. <laughs> I thought a penalty. <laughs> penalty. It's fifteen yards and blindfold, and then you get. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so the the new uh, the the Kimball College Cougars look for them on a playing field near you coming up soon. But in the meantime, you can you can hook up with Glenn Kimball online through coast to coast am dot com. And we just started talking about this. You know, some uh, Bible scholars would say that uh, that Ramses the first would have been the Pharaoh af- associated with. Um, with with Moses, and you're saying n- n- no to that, right? You're not saying it, no, you're it saying easily could have been. Well, but I thought you were putting him kind of in the more in the category of um, later in the uh, in the after what's it, Amantrope or what was the one you were mentioning Amantrope before? Amantrope chapter third. Yeah, I thought that was later, isn't it? Uh, no, actually, uh, th- there's a book called The Test of Time by David Roll, and he claims that the events that took place. Uh, uh, that we have a real calendar problem. And uh, I'll let uh, David explain the calendar problem, but what we found out when they discovered the, the documents of, at Tel Armana uh, was the fact that the entire second half of the 18th dynasty of the pharaohs of Egypt had been erased completely from Egyptian history. All of them had been. All of the second half, beginning with uh, Amenhotep III and Tia's son, uh, Akhenaten. Akhenaten is erased. The only the only time we have him restored has been when we've discovered the discoveries at Tel Armana. Okay, and this all gets very complicated, except to say the difference is really crucial between, say, 300 years between uh, Joseph coming to Egypt and becoming a very important person under the Pharaoh and the father-in-law of a future pharaoh and and say 150 or even fewer years between Joseph and Moses and and somewhere in there that this and this is before we get to Ireland and all how this all the story is going to take us that the what we have here is some sort of shift that happens because we're, the, the at least the bible story tells us I don't know if there's any other source that backs us up that all of Joseph, uh, Joseph's brother, all of Joseph's family gets the most coveted land in Egypt, right? That's the the delta, the very fertile delta valley. That's correct, and they got the they got the very fertile uh, delta valley after, by the way, they had already grown the grain to save uh, the uh, the pharaoh from and his people from famine. So they were taken back at that moment in time and and given back that uh, favored status ground. There's in, an interesting thing about, uh, uh, about Goshen. Goshen at the time of Moses had uh, 12 fingers coming off of the Nile River headed toward the Mediterranean. Today there's only one. Uh, the, if, if, in fact, this, uh, the Hebrews had been slaves in uh, Egypt for a very long time, they could have escaped out 12 different routes out there at any moment they wanted to do that. So that the stories that we have about slavery in Egypt are not traditional slaves in the sense of Roman slavery. Uh, in fact, there have been books written by uh, uh, people like Bakir uh, in his book, Slavery in the, in the Pharaonic Egypt. He said that slavery in the traditional sense of the word really only existed 
uh, at the very end of the 18th dynasty, which would have been at the time of Moses, all the way to the 22nd dynasty, which would have taken in, into account people like Ramses the Great and his progenitors as well. But, but in this case, they're saying like the the uh, the pyramids were built with conscript labor. You were paid in food and clothing, but you were paid. And 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 the and the certainly the pyramids were built a thousand years before Moses' time or right. more. So right. It, which and then then the Sphinx too. Which even though I think in popular fiction you, you see you see Moses and the people building the pyramids. That there's no there's no real reference to that in the Bible. That that's a complete myth. Right. Okay. Uh, th- that has no association whatsoever. That's not not biblical. It's not Egyptian history. It's 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 a complete popular myth if that's what we really believe. Okay. Uh, th- but one part of that story is true. And Zahi Hawass, who is, uh, you know, I've met with Zahi Hawass several times, uh, obviously with the Princess Malik. Uh, uh, he was right. He said that the story of, e- of Egypt was not the story of slavery like you'd find in Rome. Uh, at the time of the between uh, Julius Caesar and uh, and Constantine, uh, there were more slaves in in uh, Rome than there were citizens. That was almost never the case, and probably never was the case in Egypt. Egypt was famous for paying people to build cities, famous for using people uh, paid laborers in their military. Uh, they paid their artisans, their craftsmen. Uh, these people were the breadbasket to, to the world as well as the artisans to the world, and they paid for what they got. And so Sahi is absolutely correct. So the story that we get from the movie The Ten Commandments and Cecil B. the Mill is, is a, distorted by our view of the Roman Empire, not a real story in the sense of slavery in this traditional sense of the word. Now, that doesn't mean that they weren't abused or, or, um, uh, or controlled or even impoverished, and even some of them were house slaves. Uh, uh, that that may have very, very well okay. been true on a limited basis. But the slavery that was experienced at the time of Moses was a servitude, not a slavery in the traditional sense of the word, and we're going to talk about that. Okay, but either way, they get they leave. I mean, they, the, the, we can go, I don't know if you want to spend any time on the, on the 10, you know, plague things, but I mean, or, we're saying Joseph... Um, and eventually, within three generations or four generations, Moses is being raised in the household of the Pharaoh again. But this time, the circumstances are very different. It's conscript labor or it's forced labor with some compensation, but it's not what it was like underneath Joseph. And so they decide to leave. Fair enough? Yeah, they decide to leave. And by the way, Moses is... Uh fights battles with conscript uh, soldiers, and that's part of the story we're going to talk about, because one of the people that Moses, at the very first of the movie, The Ten Commandments, remember he's fighting the battle with the Ethiopians, and he comes back a victor. One of the people that was fighting alongside him was a very famous man by the name of Gethalus, and Gethalus's ancestors were the founders of Athens. Uh, in fact, his father, Cecrops, was the namesake after, we, after the man, Cecrops, who did found Athens. And he sailed into Egypt with his armies and was paid by Pharaoh to fight in the wars against the Ethiopians alongside of Moses. And Moses and Gethalus knew each other. In fact, there's stories about little uh, interactions between Moses and Gethalus, one of the most famous being that uh, Moses cured Gethalus of a snake bite, um, uh, which is kind of interesting. Hmm. Uh, uh, so you... Moses and Gethalus knew each other. Gethalus now is Greek, but the one of the rewards that Gethalus got paid for fighting along Moses, aside Moses successfully in the Ethiopian wars, was a wife. The wife he was given was her name was Scotha. She was the daughter of Pharaoh, probably the daughter of Akhenaten himself. All right, in Akhenaten, that's also the same family that gives us. King Tut? Yes. King okay. Tut was the son of Akhenaten. But now let's find out who Akhenaten is for a moment. Okay. Okay. Joseph has a daughter by the name of Tia. She marries Amenhotep III. Uh, now, Akhenaten, or Amenhotep III already has a wife. He marries his sister. Because in order to be able to keep the pharaonic legacy uh, dynasties in order, the dynasties usually came through the daughter, not through the son. It was kind of a 
a weird situation there in Egypt where where the pharaonic uh, power came through the daughter, not through the not through the uh, son. All right. So 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 he Amenhotep marries his sister, but and doesn't do, have and... children from her. He really has his family from Tia, which is the daughter of Joseph. Okay, and so they have a son or a daughter. They have a son by the name of Akhenaten. Okay, and Akhenaten then later has uh, King Tut? That's correct. Okay. King Tutankhamun. Okay, so so that would only be, that would make Joseph the, wait a second, uh, great-grandfather of King Tut. That is correct. All right, now that's weird because you'd never hear that. We never say Tutankhamun's great-grandfather was Joseph. Nobody ever says that. Except for some famous people like Sigmund Freud. Really? Yeah. Well, how did he get that? <laughs> well, he was there. I mean, he was he, he was the one of the very first people interested in the discoveries at Tel Armana. Okay. All and right. so one of his 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 last book just before he died, six months before he died, was called Moses and Monotheism, which is very strange for for this uh, founder of psychotherapy in the world to have written about Moses. But he was extremely interested in the story of Moses, and especially in the finds at Tel Armana. Uh, since 1907, the finds began in 1907. And so he begins to write about about Moses. And since his day, there have been many scholars now who have written about the relationship between Moses, Akhenaten, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But, but remember now, if in fact Akhenaten is a son of Joseph, he is not a Levite. He is now a son of Joseph. He's not a Jew. He's a son of Joseph. Okay. okay. This, this is very important that we keep the tribes separated here for just a moment. All because, right. And go ahead. Sorry. Because the original promise of Abraham to his wife Sarah was that she that through her the kings of the earth would be born. And that promise followed the birthright son not the fifth son who was Judah. Okay. I'm a, I mean, I'm, I'm just going to speak for a lot of listeners when I say at some point you start to need a chart to keep track of all the names and the, and the lines between them. So I want to just send that caution out that I'm afraid you're, I'm going to glass over here unless I actually have this sort of written down, and I'm trying to. The important part here of this and kind of the intriguing part for me is that somehow Joseph might be preserved like any royal family member in Egypt. And, and you believe that there actually is the mummy of Joseph? Yes. Akhenaten uh, was supposed to be buried in the Valley of the Kings, uh, was not. But Joseph, as being the second of uh, in under uh, Amenhotep the third, he was in fact buried in the Valley of the Kings, as was King Tut and and uh, Semkare and I. All of these 18th century dynasty pharaohs that were erased and are do, and no longer appear in Luxor are all buried in the Valley of the Kings and were hidden. They right, were now... hidden so well that even the people who built their tombs were were buried with them. And no one knew. By the time of Moses, no one even knew where they were buried. Then how do we know who they are? What do we know? How do we know somebody's Joseph? Uh, the, there is the, you know, the mummy of Joseph exists in the Valley of the Kings. Because we have discovered the the mummy of Joseph in the Valley of the Kings in KV forty six. He and his wife, and the records of his daughter being married to Amenhotep the third, and this whole story has been exposed, as well as the as the uh, scarabs that were were minted at the time that they were alive, indicating that that Tia was the daughter of Joseph, who was sold in Egypt, all of this was discovered at Tel Armana. Tel Armana is important because Tel Armana is the city that Akhenaten built. It was built exactly on the dimensions of the Temple of Solomon, with a temple exactly on the dimensions of the Temple of Solomon, only the interesting part is it was built hundreds of years before the Temple of Solomon. 
Okay, and so the and it, so this this mummy of Joseph is actually labeled Joseph. I mean, or Joseph, father or stepfather, or however the, we look at him. The, the, the mummy that exists, father-in-law of the of the pharaoh. The 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 mummy that exists is comes by the name of Yuya. His wife is Tuya. Yuya is a colloquial phrase for the name Yosef or Joseph. Okay. That's pretty cool. I mean, that's uh, that's that has to be, if that exists, if the body of Joseph exists in an embalmed mummy form, isn't that would not would that not be the only physical body of any biblical figure mentioned in the Bible? It's the greatest find in the century, and we've had it all along, and we've had it all along. Okay, and 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 does any does mainstream scholarship taking nothing away from Kimball College? I'm not saying you guys aren't going to dominate the Big Ten or the SEC or whatever you know conference you join, but is, has any mainstream scholars been talking about that mummy? Where's I, where's the body? With I assume it's somewhere in London or something like that, right? The uh, no, it's in the it's it's in the uh, Cairo Museum. All right, in the Cairo Museum, that that mummy of of Yosef, is it recognized as Yosef of the Bible by Egyptian archaeologists? It is. Okay. That's pretty cool. Ahmed Osman, who's Islamic, he was one. Who was the one that first wrote the book of Moses and Akhenaten and the Hebrew pharaohs of Egypt, probably the foremost Egypt, Egyptologist scholar in our day with the, with the most books written about this topic. He is the one that talks about this mummy being Joseph. He has no axe to grind. He's still Islamic. He is okay. Islamic, pure and simple. All right, so, be- and that's something. That, that mean, that's meaningful to me. I mean, I think that's really something. But I, I, before we get too far off the track, I want to go back to where we started, which is at some point then, though, you know, the here's for whatever reason, things have gotten sour, fast, nobody feels like sticking around anymore. And so Moses decides to take all of the people. He convinces Pharaoh through means both divine and human to to let you know his people go, and they and they go. Uh, where do they go? Well, where where did the children of Israel go? Well, first of all, why did they want to leave, and why did they have to ask permission to leave? Well, if they were forced, if they were. Working, if things had gotten bad, originally they owned the land, but maybe that was taken back. They were forced to give up whatever crops they had to give them to the Pharaoh. I mean, I don't know. You tell me. I'll I'll give you a hint. Well, more than a hint, I'll tell you the story. The last part of the Pharaohs in Egypt of the 18th dynasty were all Pharaohs from the house of Joseph, and they were Israelite Pharaohs. That is why the priests of Amun by the time of Hormheb, or the end of the 18th dynasty, had to erase these pharaohs from all history. They had to be gone. And they did effectively erase them until 1907, when they found the records of these pharaohs in the Valley of the King, and Howard Carter found the tomb of Tutankhamun in the Valley of the Kings. Suddenly, we now have history that is starting to flow like an ocean, like the breaking of a dam in our day, where, where we suddenly are restoring a record of pharaohs in Egypt that were, in fact, from the house of Israel. Okay, so they turn on the children of Israel because a new house comes to power. Essentially, let's say the you know the Republicans or the Democrats, however you want to look at it, but somebody comes to power— and they try to obliterate the history of the family group that had come before it because they weren't Egyptian enough or something. They want to make a claim for all of Egypt, so they sort of fudge the history, and and things get bad for the children of Israel. It's it's where this part of the story picks up that it really begins to take off. It's and exactly we'll, right. You're right, Ian. We'll start right there, coming up in just a What happens then when— in this new research that Glenn Kimball is coming up with, what happens when the children of Israel take off? Well, they don't all go in the same direction. And that explains a lot. Next on Coast to Coast Live.